Uh, so let me just make an announcement and then we should be good. So um, hello and welcome back everyone in this track. Uh, the next talk we have is uh, optimizing image recognition with OpenVINO, with Intel OpenVINO on Open Data Hub. Uh, so we have Sean Pryor and Ryan Looney for this talk. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A section or just put them in the chat directly. Uh, and with that said, the stage is all yours. Go ahead, folks. All righty. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean Pryor, as mentioned. This is Ryan Loney. We are here to present on uh, Intel OpenVINO on Open Data Hub. So to get started, um, I'll be talking a little bit about Open Data Hub, a data and AI platform for the hybrid cloud. So for anyone not already intimately familiar, uh, Open Data Hub is a big meta project that, that aims to bring together a lot, of the, a lot of the tools that one would need to do all this kind of data science. So we have Selden for Model Server, and we have Kubeflow as, as sort of the, the main backend component, and we have OpenVINO as part of, as enhancing uh, training and inference on Intel-based CPUs. So when we when we go through ai there are there are multiple sections here so uh we have uh in open data hub we have pieces to take care of stuff about data storage we have things like ceph we have parts to take care of data ingestion and transformation and then that's all on the data engineering side and for the data scientist we have all of the all of your familiar tools for data analysis building training testing your models and we also have plenty of tools to do uh, monitoring, model serving, optimization, detecting drift, all of that stuff. And all of it is integrated into Open Data Hub as a, as a one source of all of your tool needs for doing AI and ML on OpenShift. And additionally, it is available today from the uh, Open Data Hub community operator. So to, to take a look here, we have uh, some of the names called out here, Ceph for your storage, uh, Kafka and Strimzy for streaming, Superset, Hue, all of the Apache projects have a space somewhere in here, uh, Spark, Thrift, all the stuff you'd expect for doing data analysis. For AI and ML, all of the stuff you expect like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and some distributed training mechanisms like Kubeflow, PyTorch job, TF job, et cetera. And we have stuff like Selden, KF Serving, and OpenVINO model server as different ways that you can distribute your model, Prometheus and Grafana, of course, standard monitoring tools, and pipelines and other, other components that you might need. So. The goal of Open Data Hub is to create this blueprint for building and running any kind of AI ML workloads, simplify all of the streaming and all of the minutia of doing this. And it is all done in a nice, secure, hardened Red Hat security guarantee kind of way. So now to talk about the specifics of OpenVINO, we have Ryan Loney. Take it away. Sure, thanks, Sean. So yeah, hi, I'm a product manager at Intel uh, for the OpenVINO toolkit. And just to give sort of a high level, uh, we take uh, trained deep learning models from the popular frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch and optimize them for deployment on uh, different Intel hardware. So uh, whether it's a data center server with a Xeon processor uh, at the edge with Core, Atom, or integrated uh, GPU, uh, we, we optimize the neural network so that it can uh, be deployed uh, for inference uh, on these platforms. We also, uh, and Sean, if you want to tap one more time, I think it's, uh, yep. there we go. <laughs> and so we, we, with the goal of deploying on Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and when we say Linux, we also are including OpenShift uh, environments uh, uh, where we, we have an operator uh, for OpenVINO so you can easily manage and deploy and we're gonna talk a little bit uh, more about that. We also do have some tools for quantization aware training that actually help uh, sit on top of TensorFlow and PyTorch to do quantization aware training or training with sparsity. Um, but primarily we're focused on getting those trained models 
ready for deployment and getting the best performance on Intel architecture. And this is just another high level way to look at what OpenVINO is doing. Uh, if you push, there we go. Yeah, so taking an imp oops, input image, doing some pre-processing, sending it to uh, an OpenVINO optimized uh, graph uh, that can run on any of the hardware backends, and then we're going to get a prediction. So this is a simple image classification example, and uh, there's a number of other use cases. So image recognition is, is really just the tip of the iceberg, but it's you know uh, the most common and, and, and where a lot of this journey started was with image uh, classification. So we've had a lot of adopt, adoption within the ecosystem. A number of our partners, whether they're ISVs, uh, ODMs, uh, systems integrators, uh, have adopted OpenVINO, and they're either using it to build solutions for their customers to help them optimize their uh, deep learning inference performance, uh, so taking AI into production. And this is just uh, some of the, the partners that we've worked with who are actively uh, using our developer tools and deploying uh, with our optimized runtime. Only some of them, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody likes to have their logo on, on our slides for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, uh, the one of the techniques that we use, uh, so OpenVINO is built on top of the uh, one API, one DNN, uh, the low level libraries that Intel provides for uh, optimizing uh, performance on Intel hardware, but we do some additional uh, uh, processing of these models to help them get additional throughput and further improve the performance. So uh, some of these optimizations uh, that we do automatically are operations fusing, uh, stride optimizations, convolutions fusing. These uh, will help eke out additional performance gains uh, so that you can have more frames per second uh, for your uh, image classification, object detection, segmentation, you name it. And if that's not enough performance, we also have tools. I mentioned the quantization aware training uh, tools. Uh, we also have post-training quantization. So if you have a model where you've invested a lot of time, hours and hours, maybe weeks or months uh, in, invested in training, uh, a really great model that you want to deploy, but you're not getting enough performance. We have a tool for post-training quantization, and this comes uh, installed automatically if you, you use the Open Data Hub integration, and Sean's going to show us a little demo of the, the Jupyter environment. Um, so if you use Open Data Hub, and you install the OpenVINO toolkit operator uh, from the Red Hat ecosystem catalog, uh, free uh, open source operator, you can uh, access these tools and do quantization, which is the process of reducing the precision. So going from floating point 32, for example, and bringing it down to integer eight uh, precision with minimal drop in accuracy. And so the accuracy aware uh, quantization is where you can actually define the maximum amount of accuracy you're willing to accept and will quantize the model up to the point where uh, the accuracy hits that threshold. So we also have a lot of pre-trained models. We have uh, the Open Model Zoo, which is a collection of models for uh, all of these different use cases, object uh, detection, text spotting, natural language processing. We have action recognition, question answering, uh, time series forecasting. These pre-trained models are both trained by Intel, and we also have a collection of uh, public models that are trained and provided uh, in open source where you can download them, convert them to the OpenVINO format, and use them. And uh, Sean's actually going to show us uh, one of the demos you'll see is, is, is pulling some of these public models and, and actually using them for optical character recognition. Uh, one of the key features for deploying in OpenShift is <clears throat> being able to use the what we call a model server. So this is our uh, to create an inference endpoint for model serving. Uh, so we have uh, the OpenVINO model server just takes the optimized Intel, uh, the OpenVINO runtime, provides it as a uh, service in a container uh, based on, uh, if you use the operator on the Red Hat catalog, it's, it's based on uh, UBI, so universal base image uh, from Red Hat. And, and that will 
create a microservice that you can use to serve your models. And then if you want to scale that, I will see on the next slide that you can uh, take this and scale it with OpenShift, use a service mesh, uh, load balance the uh, requests that your applications are sending over gRPC or REST, uh, the API interfaces that are exposed by model server, and you can scale up or scale down uh, these workloads. This is a high level view of the architecture. So like I said, there's a gRPC and a REST endpoint. Uh, it's similar to, we have the same uh, front end API as TensorFlow serving. So if you've already built an application that uses TF serving, uh, it's the same uh, API calls that you'll make to the front end uh, for your applications. Uh, and under the hood, we have a configuration monitoring, which is basically checking to see if a new version of the model uh, that you have is ready to serve, if you've added additional models or changed the versions that you would like served in production. Um, anytime there's a new model, so the model management, uh, we have a concept of a model repository and I'll I'll talk about that on the slide, but basically if you up have a storage bucket like a S3 or a Google Cloud or even a OpenShift persistent volume, uh, you can keep copies of your models. And on this example here, I'm showing uh, a MobileNet V2 and a ResNet 50, uh, one in Onyx format and one in the OpenVINO IR, which is a bin in XML. And this is all you need to do to create a model repository. This can sit in, like I said, the storage buckets or persistent volume. And what the model server does is it's checking to see every if you've added a new version, if you've added a new version of the model because you've updated, retrained it, improved the accuracy. Uh, for whatever reason, it can reload the newest model without interrupting the service. So your applications will start to call the new, um, new model for predictions, and there won't be any downtime, which is one of the key features for the model server. And then this is one additional feature is taking multiple models and connecting them together. So uh, to reduce the number of round trips to the, the APIs, you can create what's called a directed acyclic graph or model pipeline uh, for short is, is just uh, uh, taking your input image and passing it along to one or more models, taking the input going through one model, taking that output and sending it to one or more additional models. And then uh, having the results, like you see here, we have a picture, uh, an image of on the freeway, and there's some text being detected by a text detection model. And then the second model is a text recognition model that's actually recognizing the characters. And then the response back to the application is, is just the detected text. So this really simplifies and keeps uh, these steps in memory uh, so that the inputs and outputs can quickly be passed without having to make additional API calls from the client. And how do we integrate into uh, Open Data Hub? That's actually, sorry, I, I put the wrong slide here. This should say Open Data Hub, but uh, OpenShift Data Science is based on Open Data Hub. It's a new product from Red Hat, uh, and Open Data Hub is the open source version that we're talking about today. Uh, but OpenVINO plugs directly into the uh, Open Data Hub Jupyter Lab environment. And we also can deploy the model server instances uh, into uh, the OpenShift cluster where Open Data Hub is installed. So if you could uh, do the next slide. All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. So this is what it would look like. Uh, oh, uh, if you're if you're going to deploy the OpenVINO toolkit operator, so uh, from Operator Hub, if you try to install, oh, search for OpenVINO and click install, you'll you'll get the OpenVINO operator. And if you want to uh, focus just on deployment, like I was showing the model server, create a serving endpoint. Uh, you can do that by creating an instance of the model server. If you're planning to do development and you want to have access to the developer tools like the model optimizer, open model zoo, uh, the uh, tutorials that come in the form of Jupyter notebooks, uh, you would create a notebook instance. And that's what's going to enable us to quickly access 
the OpenVINO developer tools and tutorials directly from Open Data Hub. And so once you've, uh, if you're using Open Data Hub and you go to the Jupyter Spawner, which is one of the key features in Open Data Hub, uh, if you've installed the OpenVINO operator, you'll have the option to select OpenVINO Toolkit, uh, as you see on the left, and click Start Server. And once you've started the uh, notebook server with OpenVINO selected, you'll have access to some of the Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, that, and you can see a screenshot of that on the right. The one that I'm showing here is a, a Jupyter Notebook that shows how to quantize a, a BERT model, uh, which is a natural language processing model. Uh, and it's an end-to-end -end tutorial. You can click Run All, and it will download the data set, download the pre-trained model, and execute step-by-step -step the process for doing this post-training uh, quantization. If you could get the next slide. Great. Uh, I think we missed one. Whoops. But it's... <laughs> Well, we'll cover some of this it's, in the we'll, demo. Yeah, you'll see yeah. it in the demo, actually, so it's fine. This is just showing once you've deployed the model server instance, which actually Sean's going to show you. So it's even better to see it live than have me try to ex explain it. But And, yep. and the, he's, he's going to go ahead and show us what those API calls look like. Once you've uh, deployed your model and created that serving endpoint, we have an API reference that can show you how to uh, make the API calls to the endpoint. And there's some sample Python and C++ code so that you can directly call the API from your applications. And now, the thing everyone's been waiting for, the actual demo. So, as we see here, we have already installed our OpenVINO toolkit operator, providing both APIs here. We have a notebook already created, and over here, Ta-da! We have the actual notebooks that you'll see given by Intel. So we have our OpenVINO inference engine import here. And for this model, what we're going to attempt to do is take and do image segmentation for detecting the road on, on this image. Very useful if you might happen to have a self-driving car. Uh, and with the inference here, it I restarted the kernel. Uh, and if we hit run all, you see almost instantaneously it's able to detect the road. Just CPUs, no GPUs are attached to this pod whatsoever. And as we see here, we have the segmented road overlaid here, which could be useful for telling a self-driving car or some other, some other similar model what parts of the road are best to be moving on. Additionally, we have our mono depth. So what this one goes into is taking and detecting depth in a single image just from context in the image. No no need to do any no need to actually have one of those Intel depth cameras telling you how far away stuff is. So Lots here, again, all running on CPUs. And we can see here, it's able to detect the distance of images very easily. And interestingly, when we get down here to creating the video, uh, it was able to process all 60 frames in around 10 seconds. And this is on a fairly modest system, something you might be able to find on, say, edge devices or other smaller, smaller less powerful systems are able to achieve this, this incredibly fast uh, processing, even for video. Uh, with a slightly more powerful system, this could be done in real time. And finally, for the downloading and running of the optical character recognition, we grab a public model and we load this nice image here with some text in it. And we are able to get the bounding boxes and print out the text here 
similar to what the pipeline would be doing shown earlier. And finally, when it comes to actually serving all of these, we have a sample model server created here, which is just doing your standard ResNet. We're going to check the API over TCP and show that it is compatible with all of the all of the uh, standard API. Now we have created a service here and we've exposed a route, just very easy couple of commands to create this and it's now usable on the internet. So we're able to hit here and we're able to see model is available, it's being served, we can hit metadata here and we can see it is float input type we're able to see the dimensions so it's a uh, batch size number of color channels uh, height and width of the image and there you have it so with that I believe Ryan anything else to add before we do questions now there's a question in the chat about how much performance gain, and I'd say it's very dependent on on the model and the use case and the input image size. But we do have uh, some benchmarks uh, published, and I can uh, they don't show comparing to uh, like frameworks or anything because it, there's so many different configuration options uh, to consider. Um, so I pasted a link to the the benchmarks. Oh, sorry, they they didn't paste the right link. Uh, <laughs> I pasted a link to our documentation. Uh, there's a benchmarks link that I'm about to paste. And then on top of that, we in several of the notebooks that you can uh, view in the Open Data Hub, there's the benchmarking step that will ha happen in the notebook. So if you want to see um, like the notebook that shows how to com convert a PyTorch model, we take the segmentation uh, FastSeg model, which is an open source public model. We um, convert it to OpenVINO, and then we show the performance difference on that same CPU or uh, integrated GP device. Uh, so you can see, okay, here's the baseline performance with PyTorch. Here's the uh, improvement in frames per second once I've uh, run it on the same device uh, with OpenVINO. And there's a few other notebooks that will show that, and there's some that have the, the benchmarking tool. So we have a tool called Benchmark App that's included and installed in the notebooks. And so you can run that to get a rough idea of the performance you could get uh, with once you've converted the model. Awesome. Anybody else have questions for us? Yeah, I don't see any questions in the Q&A so far, but if you guys don't mind hanging out for like a minute or two, just to... absolutely. All right. Bring forth the questions and we shall answer them. <laughs> um, actually, so in the meanwhile, I, I have a question. Uh, and this might be just me getting like really liking this and maybe getting too greedy with what Intel can offer. But I'm wondering as a data scientist, um, so generally, uh, you would run inference on the GPU side, or like not like in a lot of the cases. So, uh, is there anything, or like, is there any optimization that you can do uh, during training time, like for like loading images or like cropping them, and like all the work that you do before passing it on to a GPU? Uh, can Intel OpenVINO help with that by any chance, or is it purely for inference? Yeah. So when I mentioned that of a tool and I'll, I'll actually I'll paste a link to it. It's it's for uh, quantization aware and uh, training with sparsity, compressing the models uh, in the training phase so that when you deploy them, uh, regardless of whether it's on a, a Intel device or not, it will it will have uh, it, you can train it for low precision and with sparsity. So when there's hardware that can take advantage of this, you can use it for uh, you can see that additional performance gain. Um, and then to say on uh, we we with OpenVINO the goal is is you can get the inference performance especially if you look at the cost uh, of the of of having an Intel CPU compare it to the number of frames per second and saying okay how do I scale this uh, to reach the number of frames that I need so if I have 
video streams. Let's say I have 40 video streams and I need to, to process uh, 30 frames per second on each video stream. It's a simple calculation for me to say, I need to have this many CPU cores available in my cluster and I need to route those frames to those CPUs. And you don't necessarily need a discrete graphics card to do inference. Uh, and it's actually much faster to load the models onto a CPU. You're not gonna get uh, the same throughput as you might get with an expensive, you know, 250 watt discrete accelerator card, um, which, you know, we're, Intel is also planning to, to offer soon. We have today, you can actually try the GPU architecture uh, in the integrated graphics. So if you have an Intel core processor in a laptop a workstation, Core i5, Core i7, Core i3, uh, the 11th generation, we have that the GPU architecture that's coming out in our new discrete GPUs uh, that will be announced very or released very soon. You can actually try that today uh, in what's codenamed Tiger Lake, uh, or in even an older laptop or desktop CPU. You can you can see the integrated graphics and use it for inference. But I would say that in most of our customers are able to hit their performance KPIs with just using a CPU backend, and they don't need to purchase uh, discrete accelerator cards. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Awesome. Looks like we do have one question here. Uh, how does the serving tool compare to others like Selden? Yeah, so uh, I don't know the exact uh, architecture of Selden. I know we've, uh, in the past, Selden did have an OpenVINO backend. Um, I know that Selden is taking many of the different uh, inference uh, servers or inf uh, model servers. Like you can have a TensorFlow serving or a KF serving or Triton, uh, different backends uh, to different engines that can serve the models. Uh, op OpenVINO model server, we only have the OpenVINO inference engine, which uh, is by design, it's very low footprint. So the the image that you need to just serve CPU uh, model, uh, serve models on CPU is just around 145 megabytes compressed. It's a very lightweight image. You know, if you look at uh, like Triton, for example, which, which has several backends as well, you know, it's like somewhere between eight and 10 gigabytes uh, for the image. So this this model server is much more optimized to be uh, lightweight and just have one backend, uh, which accesses Intel devices, uh, whereas some of the the other uh, servers have have different additional backends. So like Selden and Triton, uh, KF serving uh, that that pulls together potentially many different backends. So it's a, it's a slightly different approach. This is lightweight and it only runs on Intel devices at this time. Uh, the others you can use NVIDIA GPUs or other um, ex other hardware uh, beyond just uh, what we have for from Intel. Um, just quickly going off of that question, um, even if I didn't want to use the uh, OpenVINO backend, can I still uh, just quantize it post training and then just put the server uh, put the model back into my Selden server or something? Yeah, so the, it would not act, uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, how Selden is set up today, but if, mm -hmm. if the OpenVINO backend is there um, and if it's the latest version, so this, uh, if we're, let's say that it is the latest version, I don't know, uh, then yes, that would be true. You could go do the post training quantization, get the low precision uh, model, and then go load it uh, into the backend. And, and that's true of, of Triton also. So the NVIDIA inference server has an OpenVINO backend. You can also uh, go and load the quantized OpenVINO model on Triton inference server with the OpenVINO backend. And you'd be able to, to serve predictions uh, on a CPU only or uh, for the OpenVINO backend in Triton. All right, perfect, thanks. Anyone else? We're here to answer your questions. Oh, actually, 
if there was another one, that would probably have to be our last because I'm just now looking at the time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say uh, it's like the last final call for questions because we're almost out of time. So um, if anyone has questions, now's your chance. Or if not, you can also head out to the breakout room and continue this discussion over there. But otherwise, I don't think there's any other questions. But thank you so much, folks, for the presentation. Uh, that was that was amazing. I really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, thanks for joining. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right.